What if someone told you to stop praying at midfield on a football field? Would you keep praying? Well, Coach Joe Kennedy did. And his story, remarkable. It escalated all the way to the Supreme Court. You don't want to miss it. It's Coach Joe Kennedy joining us next. Welcome to the Unpacking It podcast, where we unpack sports, faith, and life with intriguing guests from the sports and entertainment world. Today's guest is Coach Joe Kennedy. You are going to absolutely love this conversation today. I am fired up uh, to have Coach on the show. We're going to talk about his new movie and his story, because his the movie is based on a true story, and, and so we're going to unpack his life and, and journey. And so we're gonna have a great time with him. Uh, encourage you to also check out our weekly devotional podcast that we launch on Tuesdays. And, and that's where uh, we take sports stories, parallel them to life and faith. And so be sure to uh, subscribe. Uh, you can search for the Unpacking It podcast. And we always appreciate your support. Uh, as you listen to the show and after the show, uh, we hope that you will rate, review, and comment, and always appreciate that. Uh, I do want to thank our sponsor, Upward Sports. You can check out upward.org slash unpack. And joining us now is the real-life coach, Joe Kennedy, from the new film, Average Joe. It came out the uh, the weekend of the, the 10th, and Rotten Tomatoes already has it at 98% positive. It is about his battle for religious freedom, freedom of speech. It is about bold faith. It is about enduring and fighting through, through tough challenges. And he ended up winning a landmark Religious Liberty Supreme Court case. He wrote a book about it called Average Joe. Uh, he spent 18 years in the Marines. He's a former assistant football coach, and he continues to speak across the country promoting freedom of speech. You can connect with him online, Coach Joe Kennedy. Dot com coach thanks so much for joining us here on unpacking it how are you i'm great brother man well, we're we're fired up to to have you and i want to talk all about you know what the movie is is about and 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 the the journey that that you've you've been on but i want to go back to how god ultimately prepared you for this because i want to go back to your experience growing up in in foster care your experience in the marines as you reflect back how do you, you know, look back and evaluate, wow, God was preparing me the whole time for what ultimately this, this pivotal moment that we'll end up talking about here in a bit. Yeah, and that's just his sense of humor that really plays through. I take a look back at my life from being an unwanted pregnancy, um, being adopted into a family that didn't really want me. And I was a terrible kid and I, I don't blame them for not wanting me. I was just talking about how terrible I was as a kid. And the more you think about it, the worse it gets. But I, yeah, I was kicked out of every school I've ever been to. I was a really violent, angry kid and uh, in group homes, foster homes, uh, boys homes, and really just was just mean and nasty. And, and the whole time I was growing up and, and I needed to find a place to put all that anger and the Marine Corps seemed like the perfect place because they get paid to actually go and fight. So it seemed like the perfect place for me to go. Wow, that's amazing. And so at what point in your life then did you turn toward God? Because you're, you're, you're talking about the crazy life you were living. Take us into the, the, the transformation process. Right. You know, and, and the whole time I was in the military, it just seemed like a fairy tale that there, there can't be a God when you see all this pain and suffering. When I was retiring from the Marine Corps, I met up with my childhood sweetheart and she grew up in the church, good Christian girl. Um, but I already screwed up two other marriages and uh, screwed up my son's life. Uh, she had three kids and I didn't know what I was doing, man. I was failing miserably. She had all these barriers up and, uh, you know, trying to protect herself. And I was trying to get closer to her and man, I was failing. We were about ready to have to split up because it was so bad. And I went to church and I just threw myself onto the altar. And I was like, God, if you, if you give me my wife, I'll give you my life. And he kind of was like deal and boom, next thing I know, <laughs> here I am bent, brand new baby Christian. And he's like, Hey, I want you to coach football. So yeah, it was a whirlwind after that. 
Wow. Okay. So had, had you gotten out of the Marines at this point when you, when you met your wife? Yeah. So when we got married, I, I thought it was going to stay in for quite a while, but she had a mini stroke and that, that was the no brainer for me. She needed me there. So I, I retired right at the 20 year mark and boom, my, I moved up to Washington state to be with her full time. And we were trying to make a life together. Wow. Okay. So then how did that kind of lead to you becoming an assistant coach? You said, God, put it on your heart. How, how take us through that process. Uh, because what was your background with football and, and how you ended up in, in that role? Yeah, well, I played football. I, I wasn't big enough to play in high school. I was 4'10 until my sophomore year. And so I was just a little guy. I was a wrestler, had a chip on my shoulder. And yeah, I didn't even like football players because, you know, they were, you know, big giant guys. And here was this little guy always fighting with them. Um, but I played in the Marine Corps for two years. But it, let me tell you, it's a lot different in the Marine Corps than obviously than any other football. It was just look, go over there and break that guy across from you. So that's the way I learned how to play football. And when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was out on a run one day and the athletic director from the school, from the school district stops and strikes up a conversation with me. And cause I was wearing a Bremerton shirt and he said, Hey, have you ever thought about coaching? And I'm like, yeah, no, not really. And he gave me his card and said, think about it. And then I see this guy everywhere I go, he's popping up. He, my wife, she worked for the school district, so he was bothering her. He was bothering me, and it went on for, man, about six months where he, he kept just hounding me to come in and coach football. Man, okay, so here you, you end up becoming an assistant coach, and at what point did you make a commitment to God about what you would do following games? Yeah, so uh, I finally agreed to go to uh, one of the interviews, and it was on a Friday afternoon. It was that was a funny part. We were sitting there in in the room with the athletic director, the head coach, and some other guys, and they were like, "What's your specialty? Offense, defense, special teams?" And I was like, "Man, I don't know anything about football. I don't know anything about X's and O's." And so they were like, "What in the heck? Why are we even interviewing this guy?" <laughs> and so the athletic athletic director says, tell me what you could bring to the program. I'm like leadership, discipline, team building. I could get the most out of these young men and help develop them into being better men. And they were like, yeah, let's do that. So they offered me the job and I went home over the weekend since my wife worked as a school district and we had two kids in the high school and one in the middle school. There was a lot we had to talk about. And when I was in the military, that took over my life. It, that's why I ruined all these the other two marriages is because I was married to the core. I didn't know if I wanted to get full time into coaching because I know how, how I am and I put everything into whatever I'm doing. And so in the middle of the night, that weekend, uh, facing the giants came on and man, I tell you, just put me to my knees and some about those Kendrick brothers, man, because the movie was, you know, not the greatest quality, but I tell you the message reached in and grabbed me and, and it was the first time in my life I ever heard my calling. And I fell to my knees on, on men. I, I was crying like a baby. And I said, God, I will give you the glory after every game, win or lose right on the battlefield. And that's what I did twice a week, every week for eight years. Man. So you, when you say twice a week, two games, both games, JV varsity. Is that JV and varsity? Yeah. So I was an assistant coach for the varsity, but the head coach for junior varsity. So yeah, traveling every single weekend. We had a away game and uh, a home game every single week. All right. So what did that mean that you you gave God glory at, at midfield? T take us into kind of what was what you were doing and and at that time because you were you did this for for how many years with, with people not necessarily making a big deal about what you were doing. Yeah, we were in our eighth season. So this has been going on for a long, long time. And when it first started, it was just myself out there praying because that was my covenant with God that I would give him the glory. Some of the kids said, coach, what are you doing out there after the game? And I said, I'm just thanking God for what you guys did. And they said, well, we're Christians. Can we join? And I was like, come on, man, you, this is a free country. You can do whatever you want to do. So they started coming out and it kind of grew every year. And um, it's a small community. And they started, they said, coach, can we invite the other team? Because we had, I mean, these kids play peewees together. You know, they live across the street and they go to different high schools. So 
that I was like, man, this is your team. You can do whatever you guys want to do. And then in the last uh, season, in my, our eighth year, we had every single team in our league out on the 50-yard line giving thanks after a football game. That was cool. That That is just an awesome experience. Oh, it's it, it's incredible, and and so you know, players had their their choice to do this, and so they joined you and other teams, and and so at what point then did all of a sudden this become viewed as a bad thing? Yeah, at the beginning it was actually viewed as a good thing. Uh, one of the uh, what was the administrator or something from another school district saw what we were doing uh, out there after the game, and he was thought, man, that is so cool. So he called our principal. And said, hey, I got to tell you what your football program is doing is awesome, which raised some eyebrows and well, what's so awesome. So they started an investigation. Uh, the school district has one policy throughout the state. You cannot encourage nor discourage kids in prayer. And I was like, well, that's good because I'm, I don't care either way if they come out. And so they said, uh, well, you know, people are starting to talk now once it became light, uh, you know, gotten uh, the news and everything. And they were like, well, just stop praying with the kids and everything should be fine. And I was like, well, that's unfortunate. That's what was making this thing so awesome. But, you know, hey, it's your school, your rules. I don't want to buck the system. These guys are my friends. I don't want to fight with them. I just want to coach football. And so uh, after I stopped praying with the team, they said, well, people could still see you out there praying by yourself. So they said they wanted to give me a place that I could go to to where nobody can see me and i'm like are you freaking kidding me in in america you have to hide your faith i mean that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever and so i i just said yeah well that's not going to happen and they said well you're going to have to so they gave me a letter of direction said i needed to choose between my faith and my job and if i did continue to pray i'd be put on um I'd be put on leave, administrative leave, until I comply with the school district's uh, policies. And I'm like, well, that's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take. And I went out and prayed, and boom, they they put me on suspension for the rest of the year. And then at the end of the year, great big boom, psh, do not rehire. And my, my career in coaching was over. Oh, my gosh. I mean... It it's the craziest thing. And I, it's, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, I, so when, what was the initial then reaction? Like at, at what point did it become national news? Like take, take me into the, the initial reaction and, and I'm sure, you know, friends and family are like, Hey, what's going on? What in the world? And then how did it sort of take off? Yeah. That, and that just shows the power of, of social media today. And I never understood when they say viral, man, no joke is things go viral. So I was warned not to pray. And the head coach or the athletic director was, he said, you can't pray after the game. Uh, the head coach said, you, you can't pray. And I'm like, what are they going to do? And they were like, well, they could fire you. So this was pre everything. And we just had a, a great game. It was a uh, double overtime and we ended up losing just by, oh, man, it was such a good game. But we just lost by a field goal. And after the game, it was a double header. So we had the other guys on the waiting to come onto the field. You know, double overtime is takes a lot of time. So they're wanting to get on the field, start their practice. The stadium's filled with, with two different groups of uh, fans. And I was like, well, that's cool. Uh, we're, we're not even going to have a chance to pray. So you shake hands with the other team. I was talking to the coach about um, our, our next game on Monday. And um, one of their one of their players came up and gave me his helmet and said, Coach, would you do the prayer with, with my helmet? And I was like, well, yeah, absolutely. So all the teams came running up, both teams, and I held them up. And, man, I was like, God, you're awesome. Thanks for this fight. You guys are, you blah, 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 blah. Boom. Let's get the heck off the field because their balls flying all over the place. People are. And so I look over and the head coach looks at me and he goes, they're going to fire you. And I was just, dude, you know, that sickening feeling in your stomach. Mm. I felt that. And that, so I, on the bus ride home, I, I was sitting there and I just did one post. I think I just got fired for praying hit post boom next day it's on espn and uh fox news and everything so viral overnight and then it got out of control really quick oh my gosh okay so take us in then to that that season of life where okay now all of a sudden 
people know who you are, what happened, and there's a lot of opinions about it, and now you're thrown into the the mix. How did you respond to that? And what were those conversations with God like during that time? Well, I was just questioning, you know, God, is, is this me or is this you? Because I, I was, I mean, I, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And I didn't know because I, I, I made a covenant with God, you know, to save my marriage. And I would do anything. Well, he's calling me to coach. Now am I going to turn my back on him? And so my wife and I were discussing it and she was like, isn't this, is this have to do with you being such a rebel and um, defiant the way you've always been? And I was like, well, I mean, that's part of it, but I didn't know, I didn't know how to respond as a, as a Christian. What do you do? Do you go along with it? Because I mean, I could pray anywhere. It makes absolutely no difference where I pray. And it probably, it definitely would have been a heck of a lot easier to do that. So I was questioning everything. And, but the, I tell you, I was, I was a American before I was a Christian and this rubbed me the wrong way that nobody should have to hide their, their faith or, and choose between their job and, and their, and their faith. It made absolutely no sense to me. So I was thinking, man, I'm going to, I'm going to fight and die on this hill over this because this is a 15 second prayer. This is not worth fighting over. This is not a big deal. So the school is going to have to back down because it's my right as American under the First Amendment, very clear that I, I should be able to pray. And everybody was on my side except the school district lawyers. And so I knew I was doing the right thing. So it was a ch choice between doing what's right and what's wrong, even though that would have been the easy thing to do. <sighs> Man. So, all right, so you're, you're during... During this time, you're you're going up against the the, the school district. What was the uh, the persecution like? What what kind of persecution were you experiencing, and how did that both challenge and strengthen your faith during that time? Yeah, well, I just lost my whole entire team, which was tough because we were going to the playoffs. So uh, I had to sit in the, in the stands, you know, on senior night and everything. And but all the kids came up, and I mean, the whole team came over and hugged me, you know, at halftime. And it was, it man, I was emotional wreck. So I had all the support of of the team, uh, our community, all the parents. Everybody was on my side. There was only a very few that are the biggest loudmouths out there. And it, it, it was, it was, it was weird, man. It was, it was one of those moments that you sit there and think, is this really happening? Are, are we really going to fight this much over something so simple? And so the rest of the year, I, I, man, I was getting death threats all the time. I didn't have a problem with it. When I get a death threat, you know, especially with these trolls on, you know, keyboard commanders that live in their mom's basements, it's like, yeah, you should die. We should kill you. And I'm like, well, let's meet for lunch and talk about it there, Slick. And yeah, so I only had one guy take me up on it. And he, we had lunch. We had a great time. It's in the movie. Wow. And uh, um, everybody else was just, a, you know, they were wusses. But uh, they, when they started sending letters to my wife and threatening her, that's when things got really bad. Because she was the HR director for the school district. She was in the middle of all of this. I, I mean, I just lost my team, half the coaches and, you know, fractured everything. So, I mean, I, I, I'm built as a fighter, so I, I'm, I can withstand that. My wife, on the other hand, she's full of love. She does, she hates conflict and she's thrown right into the middle of it. And man, I don't know how she did it. She, that's a strong woman right there. Well, that's portrayed in, in the movie that the tension in your, in your marriage and, and going through this experience t together as you reflect back on that, what what did you learn about uh, marriage, your role as a husband, and and how God got you through that? You mentioned your your wife being strong through all of that too. Uh, what are some lessons learned from the marriage perspective? Yeah, I really learned how to put faith first. And when she asked me what was more important, uh, our marriage or this fight, and I had to answer this fight because I wouldn't have a marriage when we guys are called to be the leaders of their households, to be the spiritual leaders. And if we're not doing that, I'm going to fail my marriage anyway. I'm going to fail my kids. Everything in my life will be a failure. So I had to stand up for what is right and, and what God was asking me to do, even if it was going to cost me everything. And I had to just believe in faith. I had to stay grounded in my faith because that's all I had. 
I, I was in doubt about everything. And when the world's collapsing on you, sometimes the only thing you have in that storm is just that little tiny bit of faith and you just hold on to it for dear life. And man, it, it just showed that God could get you through anything and really shows up when you when you need him to. He he I don't know why he doesn't show up when I want him to, but he definitely shows up when I need him to. Gosh, that that's awesome. I was just listening to the Jeremy Camp song this morning, closer to you, uh, clinging to Jesus through the storm. So uh, that was on my mind and heart this morning. But but so so you're 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 going through this 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 challenge with the the, the school board, the fight with the school board, but now all of a sudden this escalates and this gets this gets to become a a Supreme Court case. So so take us into how it escalated and how you're you know responding to the escalation. Yeah. So at the lowest court uh in, in our state, we we were sitting there and the guy was talking. I, I thought we're, this was a slam dunk. It seemed so simple to me. And he, he was saying all the right things. I prayed when I played. My my dad was a coach. He prayed with his players. So I'm thinking, yeah, we're going to score a touchdown right here. Game over. And he says, however, due to today's political climate, I can't rule in your favor. And I'm going, are you freaking kidding me? I mean, are you a weatherman? I, I, I don't understand. Justice is supposed to be blind, which that was a perfect ruling because we could automatically appeal it because... I mean, he didn't rule according to the law. So when it went to the Ninth Circuit, Ninth Circuit, man, that guy had an axe to grind. He used to be a, a, um, a school board or a school lawyer, uh, represent school districts. So he automatically had his beef against me. And I was, and which was a huge blessing, even though he talked all this smack about me, what a terrible person I was and terrible employee and all this. And, and he said... Um, he said that any, the way he wrote it up, any display of, of religion in the public square is cause for termination. Now, that should scare the heck out of everybody. Imagine that if that would have stood, that any sign, if it, like I'm wearing a cross right now, I, I got even a cross on my arm. If what, I got to hide that or I could get fired for that? What if I have a Jesus fish on my, on my car? Or, you know, I'm a, I'm a Jew and I wear my little yarmulke thing. Think about all the religions and their signs of faith. All of a sudden, that's illegal in the public square. So that was a blessing in disguise that when it went to the Supreme Court, they were like, this is, this is, something's not right here. Well, they didn't, they didn't take the case and they said, we want more facts of the case and go back. We think they made some mistakes in the lower court. So we had to start it all over again. So we lost seven times in a row in, in, in eight to the Supreme Court. And the first, uh, Court of Appeals, they even just stepped further, and the judge said that um, I was a terrible Christian because the way he reads his Bible and the way he prays is this way. And I'm going, a, a sitting judge, you're telling me how I'm supposed to pray? What, you, you're the boss of people's religion now. And that's the whole thing about the, the First Amendment is that where the state cannot do this to you. The government cannot Im impose their 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 will and um, in faith or anything, you know, in your beliefs. So that was a, that was a gift, even though it hurt. It was an absolute gift. And it went to the Supreme Court. We won six to three. And they just they they said, uh that the um, free speech and the free exercise work in, in unison together, not opposing forces. And it overturned 50 years of bad case law, old case called Lemon. And that's what screwed up everything. And, and that's what started taking God out of all the uh, public square in our schools. So we overturned that. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, some major ramifications there, too. So, man, so that... I mean, it's an unbelievable story. So we're going to talk because this is all portrayed in a movie that, that is out now called Average Joe. And, and so we'll, we'll talk about the, the movie specifically. So it's just an incredible story. And, and so you, you end up winning the case. You get reinstated as a coach, but you don't remain as a coach. So take us into to that thought process and, and what God was doing through that situation. Yeah. So um, I met with uh, uh, this guy. Um, Frank, Franklin Graham, and he pulled me and my wife off. Well, I mean, we didn't know the guy. He pulls us off to the side, and he says, Coach, 
He says, you need to go back, face your giants and, and go back to that same school, even if it's just once and thank God for having the opportunity to fight this fight. So that stuck in my head. And I didn't know what I was going to do when they reinstated me. I was so excited. I flew from uh, Florida back up to Washington, got my reinstatement letter, went and checked in with the head coach and spring ball was just starting. So I was all excited about, you know, joining the team. Well, they weren't the happiest to see me, if you can imagine. Now, this is a new head coach and a new um, coaching staff. Nobody, None of these guys know me. They've only heard about me, and they're being forced to take me back. And that put them in a weird situation. Now, they were pretty good about it, but the school district, were the they, they were just jerks, man. I, I, I got no other way of saying it. They said, oh, well, you can't step onto the field and interact with the kids until you have all these certifications and the qualifications and all this schooling. And I'm going... This isn't even the, I'm not even really hired yet. It doesn't start until the fall. We don't need this stuff until, you know, the season starts. So they hit me with red tape for two weeks. I didn't even get a step on the field once in spring ball. And I was annoyed. I, I was pretty annoyed. And I told the head coach, well, let's try again in the fall. So I showed up uh, for fall camp, did everything, the two days, the whole nine yards of fall camp with those guys, worked out with them every single day. And when we got to, finally got to the first game, they made it very clear that they did not want me there. And I, I don't blame the, the coaching staff at all, but the school made it terrible. You know, they they wouldn't allow me to talk to the kids. How, how can you coach if you can't talk to the kids? Um, th what, what else did they do? They, oh, oh, yeah, I wasn't allowed to go to any of the meals. Uh, because the team gets together for breakfasts, uh, they have the uh, team meals. Then they have the parents' meals on on Friday or Thursday night before the game. I wasn't even allowed to attend any of those. So really, I was just standing there. I wasn't allowed to do anything, and I, I didn't have a locker. I wasn't allowed in the coach's room. I mean, everything they just made it made it it sucked. So. Uh, we talked about it after the first game and uh, went to practice that Monday. Uh, well, I went to the game, did my prayer. Nobody even noticed is the way it's supposed to be. Such a good game. Nobody even noticed I was praying after the game. And I, I, my wife and I discussed it and we said, you know, this isn't working out. Everybody doesn't want me here anyway. So let's, let's go with our head held high and let's just resign and you can retire and walk away with your head up. And that's what we did. We moved back down to Florida to take care of her dad for the rest of his his days. Man. Well, so how how hard was that to do that? And how did God give you a piece about that? I, I didn't have any peace because, you know, the, I wanted to fight. Because okay. that's not right. I mean, really, are you going to re really retaliate against me? This is a perfect learning moment where you could sit there and say, hey, this is what the courts ruled. And this is why we could have taught the kids everything. But they took it as they lost personally for some reason. And I, I didn't understand that. I mean, I'm trying to teach these guys to be good winners and good losers because you have to in, in sportsmanship. So the school was just, they were terrible. And so, I mean, I was mad. I was upset. I went through all the different phases. Um, as I was flying, I, we gave our letter of resignation like at four o'clock in the morning as we were um, going to the airport and it was hard to hit send because uh, I worked so hard to get back there. But as as the flight went on, I, I started feeling better about it. We prayed about it and prayed about it. And when we got here to uh, back to Florida where her dad is, we just got his CT back. And he's got, man, that dude's a mess. So it, it, it worked out good. It was an absolute blessing in disguise. And um, God knew what he was doing. So uh, he said, just take your message on the road and 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 share what you've learned and and everything still live for me so that's all i've been doing is going where god's called me to go i love it well that no that's awesome and I'm, I'm thankful to hear that and and so now your story is on the big screen and so first off what what is that like how, how do you feel someone portraying you and your story and uh eric close has actually been a guest on our show so love eric he's an awesome actor but but what has this this experience been like for you weird i mean <laughs> put it in one word it is so weird because i mean you you have a backstory everybody's got a backstory life is is never you know the rosy colored pictures with unicorns and butterflies i mean life is tough so it's weird that they're telling my story because it's just my wife and my story it, it, there's nothing 
to, to us incredible about it. That, but it shows that God can use anybody. If he can use an idiot like me, imagine what he could do with guys like Eric Close and, and, and you. So it, it was so cool to, to work with Eric. He spent about 10 minutes with me and goes, oh, I think I got you figured out, coach. And we became immediate <laughs> friends. And we, we call each other every week now. We're busting each other and just... It's great. Uh, the girl who played uh, my wife, uh, Amy Acker, plays Denise. She was phenomenal. They had the best chemistry on. And she spent days with my wife learning her mannerisms, uh, the facial expressions that everybody's going to see. Because you know when your wife gives you that look? Yeah. Yep. She nailed yep. that. I was like, oh, yeah, they're good. So um, the guy who directed it, Harold Kronk, was awesome. He's a really good friend of mine now. And it just was a, a huge eye opener to to see how films develop and and how everything works and to see people that are, you know, playing all these hard parts in your life. It, it was tough. It was tough to sit there. I can't, I couldn't be there for some of the scenes and um, uh, filming some of the scenes and my wife couldn't be there for other ones. We had to deal with a lot of junk that we've never dealt with. We just moved on from it. So now it's all right there on the big screen and. We're not hiding anything. So it's it's not the rosy tale of, uh, you know, it, it it's real life. It, it shows the highs and lows. It's, it's an emotional roller coaster for people. They're going to laugh. They're going to cry. They're going to be pissed. I mean, you're going to hit everything in this movie. Gosh, it looks phenomenal. The The trailer looks great. I can't wait to watch the, the, the full movie. Uh, it's called Average Joe. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fired up about it. So. You mentioned it was difficult to, to watch some of these scenes. Has it provided healing for you going through this process of, of putting the movie together and then watching it ultimately? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of things uh, my wife and I never have discussed. Some of the things in her past, we we know our past is there, but we never sat there, there and discussed it. And what does that mean to us today? And how do we feel about sharing this with, with um, the world? And it, I tell you, it, it brought us a lot closer. We had these discussions about some of the things, some of the fights that we had that we never shared our emotions. We just fought it, made up and moved on, but we never really talked about it. But it's really solidified our faith and really just shows what God can do. The power of a praying wife, uh, being steadfast in your faith. And really just when you look at the big picture, um, when you see it on the big screen, it's like, Wow, God is so amazing. You get to see it all in its glory. That's that's only God, man. That is just the coolest thing. Gosh, and to see his hand through it all. And even a little thing, like you, you mentioned, part of your story was watching Facing the Giants. And that had a key impact on you. And here you are, years later, putting together a, a somewhat of a football movie uh, and, and, and a, a powerful story in, 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 in that realm. So, uh, so that's cool, too. So all those little things and, and to see... Yeah, God continue to, to work in and through you. And, and so you, you mentioned this a little bit, but but what do you hope is the 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 message and what you know the audience leaves with? What what's what's the hope? Well, yeah. Uh there, I, I, I really didn't know until I watched it a few times. Um and and what I really want people to walk away with is a newfound appreciation for being an American and what the constitution means to to us as as a society. And really, it opens our eyes to that. Also, uh, about um, our relationships, how they're not always nice, they're messy, and they're complicated. So this this will inspire people in their marriages to stick stick it out and and have that family aspect of things. And also, um, the third thing has got to be your faith in the Lord, and really that you got to trust in God. And hopefully, it'll bring people closer together to to. Uh, their relationship with the Lord. So hopefully to bring all three of those things and really motivate and inspire people when they walk out, just feel like, I think like a Rocky movie, you know, you walk out of there and you're ready to take on the world. I want people to, to be bold in their faith and, and uh, proud to be an American and flex their, their constitutional rights the way that it should be done. Mm. Wow, what what an inspiration! And I and I love the the name of the movie, Average Joe, because it allows all of us to sort of resonate with that. There you are, you're 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 a football coach, high school football coach, and the impact that you you've been able to have that God has made through you, it opens up the door for all of us. To to your point, you know, any of us can be used by God if we're committed, open, and 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 
brave and bold to say, all right, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And I don't know where Absolutely. this is going next. And, and I'll take the next step of faith. And, and so I guess one last thing as we, we wrap it up, but the, the, the boldness of our faith and, and even you kind of said, you know, we got to stand up strong. In what ways have you learned about humility in that? Because boldness in fighting requires, all right, I'm going to go. I'm going to, and, and we, and sometimes we can even, you know, uh, put our, our strength. It's all about what I can do. What have you learned about humility and dependence on God to give you that boldness, to give you that strength, to go out and, and fight for him, with him in, in whatever we might face? Yeah. And I just put it all on God because, um, I, I even got it tattooed on my arm. It's uh second Timothy four, seven, which is fight to good fight, finish the race and remain faithful. And I think that's just the key to really in life. We are called to fight the good fight. Nowhere in there does it say that we win because God's got that victory already. Let him worry about that part of it. We just got to finish the race and remain faithful the whole way through. And that's what all you got to do. I mean, it's a very simple concept. You do what's right, even if it's not popular. Now, it's not always easy to do, but it's the simplest thing. And that's all you need to do is put your faith in God and let him work out all the details. Mm. In surrender. That's it. That's, that's it, that's buddy. Cool. You know it. That's awesome. that's awesome. Well, man, we'll we'll end it right there and encourage people to check out CoachJoeKennedy.com and, and go see the movie. It's out now. It's called Average Joe, 98% positive on, on Rotten Tomatoes. A couple knuckleheads in there didn't like it, but hey, it's part of the deal. So 98%, you got to love it. Um, and so what Eric Close, again, awesome actor. So the acting's great. Uh, it's a, it's a well done movie. I can't wait to, to, to watch it myself and, uh, wish you the best with, with all that you're doing kind of around this movie and moving forward with your story and, and sharing, you know, the good news of Jesus and, and also standing up for, for what's right and, and, and boldness. And I think the message too, of just, you know, dealing with it, it persevering and enduring and persecution and no matter what comes. And so all those things are, are wonderful and, and great to have people like you, uh, standing up for it and uh, and and being a, a great light in, uh, in in a lot of you know, darkness and challenging situations that 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 people are facing in the world that we're living in right now. So, thank you. Wish you the best, and and really appreciate you being a part of the show today. Hey, thanks, brother. And I I'd love to talk to you again after you see it. Uh, give me a call. We'll we'll chat about it, buddy. Absolutely. I'm I'm looking forward to it. My, my wife will uh, will enjoy it as well. So, uh, thank you. Wish you the best. He's Coach Joe Kennedy joining us here on the Unpacking It podcast. Whew, that was awesome. Wow. I hope everybody's encouraged to go see it, but, but along with that, just encouraged in your own faith and, and, and the boldness that, that we can live for Jesus. He's worth it. He's worth it. We saw the transformation. We heard about the transformation in, in Joe's life, and, uh, and, and hopefully we can resonate with that as well, the ways that God has changed us. Uh, let's not forget those things. Let's remember his faithfulness and keep moving forward uh, in, in endurance. All right, he's, he's Coach Joe Kennedy. For Aaron, my producer, I'm Bryce Johnson. I'm a sports fan who follows Jesus. I believe in the good news that he died on the cross for my sin. He was resurrected, and through faith, I've been saved by his grace. I hope that is true for you as well, and I hope you'll join me as we live life as sports fans who follow Jesus together. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you next time right here on the Unpacking It podcast.